it is wonderful to have the opportunity to share this work. As writers, I feel as though we write with the dream of a reader in mind. And for those who have read the book, for those who might read it in the future, I thank you for engaging with my words. And I hope that this work can spark conversations within our region and can spark practical actions toward change. I want to begin with on a note of gratitude also. Um, I have the enormous privilege of having the opportunity to share this work, but this is work that has been deeply team-based, deeply collaborative, and I've had the gift of many mentors and collaborators in this process, student research assistants, those who were recent graduates of Dartmouth College who have helped me in this process, members of our community advisory board who have shared their perspectives and have helped me to understand key issues and what really matters to people who are impacted by housing insecurity. And most importantly, the families and others in this work who welcomed me into their lives. And I've also been fortunate to be able to braid together various funding resources to support this work over many years. So I want to begin with a bit of background about the approach that I used in this work. So I'm trained as a medical anthropologist. And what this means is that this is work that involves working closely with people in their communities to understand their everyday lived experiences. This anthropological method is called ethnography, and it's an immersive form of inquiry. And so the premise of this work is that I spend time with people in the settings of their everyday lives to learn about their routine practices, what they do, what's important to them, what their needs are, what their priorities are. And when I was initially engaging with the families in this work, I explained this by saying simply, I'd like to spend time with you to learn about your life. And so this kind of, with this deceptively simple premise, I began showing up and spending time with families at a local shelter. What had initially maybe seemed to be a strange request to have an anthropologist come and hang out with you took shape over time. With each family, I fell into steady rhythms, sitting together outside as we waited for kids to come off the bus, hanging out in the kitchen together as parents prepared meals, giving people rides to the grocery store, to Walmart, going out for coffee at Dunkin' Donuts so we could talk without the presence of other families or shelter staff. And then as families moved out of the shelter and in the community, I uh, spent time with families across a range of settings as they moved into their own apartments, doubled up with friends, camped in the woods, or stayed for long stretches and paid by the week hotels. I went with people to the doctor, to case management appointments, to welfare appointments. And so in short, I had the extraordinary privilege of bearing witness to the intimate realms of family life and to being with people during times of profound vulnerability. And I think what enabled this um, for families to really take a leap of faith and to welcome me into their lives as a witness and confidant began with me becoming a reliable presence in their lives. I showed up and I paid attention and I kept showing up. I kept paying attention. Trust was built gradually. Trust was hard won. And I think it was my continued presence and also my active listening, my non-judgmental listening, became a demonstration of my stated commitment to learning from families about their everyday lives amid homelessness. So this is the premise of the work. There's also a promise that's embedded in the work. And so from the very beginning, the applied goals were also uh, made explicit for families. And I think that part, again, of families' willingness to accept me into their lives during times of vulnerability was the promise and the expectation that I would share their experiences in service of deepening awareness of families who are experiencing housing insecurity and to advocate for changes within practice and policy 
in order to improve the lives of families in our region. And so this is really a key priority for me. It's a central responsibility for me in this work. And opportunities to share this work publicly, like the forum tonight, is one avenue, I hope, for keeping that promise um, and for deepening our awareness as a community of the housing crisis in our region, and I hope strengthening our collective commitment to urgently needed changes to cultivate opportunities for all of us to thrive in the Upper Valley. So I want to think a bit about also what brought me into this work. And if we take ourselves back in time to 2009, the beginning of this work, um, I was a, then a postdoc at Dartmouth Psychiatric Research Center. And I was interested in thinking about what are new questions that I'll be pursuing in, in research. I've had a long-standing interest in working with families during times of, of, of challenge and vulnerability. My earlier research um, had focused on families who are raising kids with mental health challenges. And so this has been a kind of cross-cutting thread for me in my work. How do families endure um, very, very difficult circumstances? And so I knew I wanted to focus on families. And then I became more aware of housing-related issues in our community. And then as I began to survey and read more literature, I saw, and I don't think this comes as a, as a surprise, that most research on homelessness has been done in urban settings within the US. And so this image here um, may be a kind of prototypical or perhaps a stereotypical image of what we think of when we think of homelessness. Um, and so in contrast, homelessness in rural areas is largely hidden. It's much less visible than uh, than it is in urban settings. And what we see is that it takes shape in different ways. And particularly um, for the families with whom I've worked, that housing insecurity is manifest in doubling up with other families and spending time in paid by the week motels, camping during the warmer months, sleeping in cars, stays in shelters. Um, it's important to note that there are encampments of unhoused people in our region. Um, but again, these tend to be tucked away and are less visible in terms of our daily experiences in our towns and villages in the Upper Valley. And families, which are my focus in this work, go to great lengths to avoid literal homelessness. This work is also somewhat different than other work on homelessness, given the fact that it's longitudinal. It stretches over a long period of time. Most of the work that's been done on homelessness really focuses on the periods of time when people are living in shelter or maybe unhoused and living on the street. And so this work is unique in that I met families when they were in residence at a shelter and continued to follow them after they exited the shelter and into a variety of community settings. And what this long-term view allows insight into is that we can see different outcomes for families over time, with some families utterly devastated and shattered by continued experiences of housing insecurity and other threats, and others moving toward a greater security. And so that enables us to really trace through our systematic uh, data collection, what is it that contributes to families' well-being? What are the things that continue to erode families' stability? over time. Some other important contextual things that I think are important for us to talk about and think about is sort of what, at a broader level, what's driving homelessness in rural New England. And there are many myths that are associated with the causes of homelessness. It's important for us to remember homelessness is a housing problem. And this is reflected in our region in terms of the incredibly limited inventory of housing that we have within our region. We do not have enough housing to meet demand within our region. The Keys to the Valley report uh, said that we will need 10,000 additional units of housing by 2030 in order to meet demand within the Upper Valley region alone. I don't think we're on pace for that. So we have extremely limited housing inventory. Um, I've learned that healthy rental vacancy rates are, are supposed to be at about 5% 
and our rates in this region are about 0.5 percent to put some numbers around that and and within that of course then there's incredibly incredible scarcity of affordable housing and part of this is that this is a region where we have a very high cost of living despite being a rural area I think people who don't live within the region are often surprised by the high cost of living. We might have a sense of rural communities being a place where housing is, if not plentiful, at least cheap. And so the Upper Valley is, is certainly challenges such a view. And part of this story is about what I describe in the book as the kind of confluence of poverty and privilege that exists within the setting. And so this is a region, and here we are in Hanover at Dartmouth College, um, um, and this is a region that attracts highly educated and skilled workers to the region. We have the college, we have the academic medical center, we have high tech engineering firms, um, which drive up housing costs. Um, and at the same time, we have quite limited opportunities to earn a living wage for those without high levels of education or with advanced training in the trades. And lower, sec uh, lower wage service sector jobs do not pay enough for market rates of rents within the region. We also see challenges that are very specific to rural areas here. Um, we see the lack of infrastructure that for larger scale you know, congregate housing like bigger apartment buildings because we don't have sewer lines, for example. We have local zoning ordinances with very, our governance structures hyper-local, and so local zoning ordinances that sometimes limit development. We also, as other areas in the country, are impacted by tremendous workforce shortages, and we see that within the construction sector here. So it's a challenging area in which to develop. Some of this also is about kind of mindset though, as well. And there's been growing attention to housing shortages in our region. Um, when I first started this work, it sometimes would come as a surprise what the focus of the work was. That's changed a lot. I think it began to change um, in 2011 in the wake of Hurricane Irene when many Vermonters were displaced. Um, and certainly, this is um, you know, in the Valley News nearly every day. You can find a story on the housing crisis or, or some impact of that. And so I think there's a lot of awareness. We know this in terms of our major employer's ability to, to uh, attract new workers into the region as well. There's no place for anybody to go. Um, and yet, even with that kind of heightened attention to the region's housing crisis, and despite progressive politics and traditions of philanthropy, it's also the case that efforts to develop affordable housing, um, workforce housing and new shelters are sometimes met with community resistance. Sometimes this is about quote unquote safety. Oftentimes we'll see this in more subtle dimensions that invoke things to do with rural and small town character. This isn't the place for it or we need to preserve the rural character of our town. And this dynamic produces kind of paradoxical responses then uh, to housing insecurity. And I describe this in the book as microgeographies of privilege and poverty. And what I mean by this is the invisible borders that demarcate areas of immense wealth from towns with greater economic diversity. And this is not just an abstraction, this has real consequences for people because these microgeographies, these micro fault lines can produce subtle yet insidious forms of social exclusion. And I want to tell a brief story. Um, a woman who I will call Nancy, um, a mother with whom I've worked for many years. Um, this was a few years of this study. She was in her late 20s at the time. She was raising two small kids. And my daughter was young at the time as well. And one afternoon, we were, our conversation turned to just talking about our weekend plans. And I happened to mention that I was going to be bringing my young daughter to a free arts uh, event um, at the College Arts Center. And I asked if Nancy might be there with her kids as well. And she looked at me and she shook her head. She said, Elizabeth, that's not a place for me. That's not a place for me. 
And that stuck with me. You know, this is something that I know that can be hard to hear for us. But I think this is an invitation for us to consider, you know, what are the ways in which we may be creating interactions that are not always so welcoming to everyone within our region, in our community. Because it's the case, this was a free event that was ostensibly open to all. No financial barriers to participation. But Nancy is calling attention to subtler contours of belonging and exclusion within the setting. And I share this story. Again, I, I, I know this, is, this can be difficult to hear. But I think it helps us to illuminate our collective responsibility to create environments that will destabilize the pervasive stigma that's associated. In this work, what I've really tried to do um, is strive to understand lived experiences of families. And part of this work is what it means to become homeless in the Upper Valley. And as an outsider to New England myself, I grew up in, um, in Maryland. I have been struck by the very profound sense of individualism and self reliance setting. I think it's something that, you know, it's very American more broadly, but this is an orientation that seems quite amplified within the setting, a kind of valorization of self-reliance. And this has implications then for how people experience times of vulnerability and financial precarity. And what we see oftentimes is that homelessness is not only about the loss of one's home, that material resource, but is also uh, comes with it a cascade of other losses. The withdrawal of friends, the rejections of pleas for assistance, and oftentimes stigma in social interactions. This is often then internalized by families as a subjective sense of failure that manifests as shame, the sense that I ought to be able to do this on my own. Because um, even amid what we know are profound constraining forces on families' experiences, we've just talked about this, the lack of housing inventory, the scarcity of affordable housing, the fact that our lower, uh, lower wage service sector jobs do not pay enough for market rate rents within the region, even knowing that, families within the study still felt as though they should be able to make it on their own. And so this uh, becomes incredibly painful for people as they're experiencing this. So I'm gonna turn now really to kind of the heart of the book. These are experiences that often remain hidden and to look closely and to be attentive to lived experiences of housing insecurity. And I want to share a story of a woman who I will call Abigail. When I first met Abigail, she was 19. We met when she was living in a family shelter with her two small kids. And prior to becoming homeless, Abigail had couch surfed with friends and stayed with her family. But over time, these relationships had frayed, and her mother ultimately kicked her out over disagreements over the children. As she was staying in the shelter, she spent months searching for housing, and this reflects the lack of uh, affordable housing within the region. And so she was thrilled when she learned that there was space available in a recently renovated apartment complex. It was subsidized housing, and her housing application had been accepted. I vividly remember her face breaking into a wide smile as she told me, it's beautiful. After five months of living in the shelter, she finally had a place of her own. And with the subsidy, Abigail's rent was capped at 30% of her income. And so this is the federal definition of what it means to have an affordable place to live, not paying more than 30% of your income. And with waiting lists for subsidized housing sometimes years long, she was truly fortunate to be moving into an affordable apartment. I came to visit her shortly after she moved in and she came me a tour. She described how quiet the place was. She said, I heard her 
kids were doing really well. Her son was sleeping better. He was eating better in the calm environment. And this marked the first time that she had lived on her own with her kids. Then as the weeks wore on, and um, I began to hear kind of mixed feelings that she had about the apartment. And I began to hear more and more about her feeling lonely in this place. It turns out that this apartment was far away from her networks of family and friends. She had met a couple of her neighbors, but she spent most days by herself, alone with her two small kids. And at one point, she contrasted this with living in the shelter. She said, so weird. I don't know. At the shelter, I was used to every morning waking up. And you know, someone will be around, and I have coffee with someone. And now I wake up to, it's just me and my kids. A few months later, Abigail and her kids moved out of the apartment and in with her best friend's family. And when I asked her about this, she said simply, I just don't want to be by myself. And this was momentous for her. She lost her housing subsidy. And this sparked a cycle of housing insecurity as she moved between tenuous arrangements of doubling up weeks in motels, and moves back to the shelter over the course of the next four years. As you can see in this image here, this is Abigail's trajectory during the time that I knew her. 14 moves over a period of four years across various settings. So what do we learn from her experience? Part of this is the need to take into account the full context of a family's life, including, but not limited, to housing. To think about the ways in which, and to take seriously the ways in which she felt isolated as a mother with two small kids, living far away from her family and friends. She didn't have a vehicle, didn't have a license. And this also, I'd like to suggest, can spark for us a question, how could this have ended differently for Abigail? And we can begin to imagine, perhaps, a different outcome. If there might have been some additional supports, or resources, or some services for her. Perhaps childcare, so that she could return to work. Access to transportation so she might have been able to see her friends and families. Even perhaps something as simple as just a regular check-in with an advocate or with a mentor. We can begin to think in this way about what might have made a difference for her so that this wasn't the trajectory for her family. And so this underscores for us the importance of thinking about the broader context of needs and what will position families to thrive. Housing is foundational, but what else might need to be wrapped around families in order for them to thrive? And so taking this long view of families' trajectories allows us to see what happens to families in the community following a period of homelessness. As I've mentioned, Abigail moved 14 times between March of 2010, when she left the shelter, and June of 2014, when she moved out of state to live with her family, with her parents. Families continued to face enduring threats to their housing and security. And this is a key finding for us, that house homelessness is episodic. So an acute episode of homelessness, I don't know where I will sleep tonight. But housing insecurity forms a backdrop for families, and it's chronic for the families with whom we work. This is why I've titled the work Families on the Edge, to evoke the specter of always being on the edge of losing housing. These families existed on the edge of homelessness, and their lives were suffused by what I describe as fundamental insecurity. This is a concept that strives to evoke the totality and the pervasiveness of instability, impermanence, and mobility in the lives of families that have experienced homelessness. And I position this as an inverse of what a scholar and researcher named Deborah Paget has described as the ontological security that formerly homeless people experience when they have a home, manifested in a sense of control, constancy, 
reassuring daily routines, privacy, and conditions that support identity construction and repair. By contrast, fundamental insecurity manifests in conditions of chronic housing insecurity, precarious forms of work, profound financial scarcity, and fragile relationships. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time teasing out what this really looks like for folks. Um, all of all of the parents in this work um, were employed over the course of the study. Uh, mothers would typically take a little bit of time away when their kids were really young out of the workforce, but then as soon as children were in school, they would return to the workforce. But people were largely working um, in lower wage service sector positions that were typically part time. So that were not benefited positions, and so people didn't have access to health insurance. Uh, people's schedules in this type of work are highly unpredictable. Um, the advent of things like robo scheduling, um, which are used by companies to enable efficiency in the use of the workforce to schedule people. The reality of that for parents was that parents wouldn't know their schedules more than a week in advance. And you can imagine, I can imagine as a working mom, I know how difficult it can be under the best of circumstances to thread that needle. Um, and then imagining not, not knowing um, if you were working Saturday, if you were working in the evening, if you were working in the morning, how are you going to coordinate care for your kids? Very, very challenging with child care. It also limits the possibilities of getting a second job, too that inability to kind of coordinate things becomes very difficult for people. I also want to note the extreme financial precarity that families endured. Money runs out. Kitchen cupboards were sparse at the end of the month. Tremendous financial precarity and food insecurity being experienced by families. Transportation in our rural area is a it's a huge challenge as we think about um, housing related issues. We always need to be thinking about this in concert with transportation. Uh, we have kind of the, our major employers and hubs of employment within the region. People typically need to travel quite long distances um, to their jobs. I want to note that um, advanced transit is an absolute lifeline for people. And uh, when people are able to find a place to live on the bus line, this opens up tremendous opportunity for them. Um, and the recent addition, for example, of evening and weekend hours is hugely helpful for people who may uh, not be working that classic Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 schedule. Really, really important. Um, they're also, as we think about kind of the geographic distribution of people, as, as people get pushed farther out and away from the kind of core towns and the hubs of employment um, as they seek more affordable housing. This then has implications um, for them. And as they're moving to more remote places to gain access to more affordable housing, there's the risk of becoming very, both geographically and also socially isolated then. And Abigail's story is emblematic of that. We also see that in the context of the limited housing inventory within our region, uh, people don't have very much choice in where they are going to, where they're going to go. And families also spoke to me about the difficulty of finding a landlord who was willing to rent to them. And so the tremendous shadow of stigma that falls over people as they're seeking a place to live. Um, with limited choice in housing, families were at risk of living in old and dilapidated structures. We have some of the oldest housing stock here in New England in the US. And so families were at risk of living in places with lead paint or with black mold. And these kinds of environmental issues really have impact on health over time. It's also the case that the kind of, you know, that fundamental insecurity, that, that chronic stress that families are under also impacts people's relationships. And so this was something that French, I saw over time the way in which steady friendships, relationships, partnerships would often fray under the conditions of fundamental insecurity. 
It's important for us to note that none of the families in this study, so they're a cohort of five who um, form the heart of this book, none of those families were able to sustain paying market rate rents on their own. Sometimes they'd be able to cobble together resources for a few months or even a year at a time. But there then would pose another challenge, another crisis, and they would find themselves packing up their belongings for yet another move. So I want to suggest that the line between people who are experiencing homelessness and those who may be, quote, making do in poverty is very blurry. And this is important for us as we, as we conceptualize, as we think about homelessness. This is, um, you know, the families with whom I'm working, we're really thinking about people who are you know, the working poor. And the long-term perspective in this work shows us how people are continuously moving across this very porous boundary. And one lost job, one illness, one car breakdown um, can pose financial devastation and yet another housing crisis for people. As we think about what can we do, Right? What is to be done? I want to share another story of Nancy, who I introduced earlier, and her children, to help us reimagine what might be possible in this space. As you can see in this visual, Nancy's experience looks very similar to Abigail's. She endured chronic housing insecurity during the first five years that I knew her. She living, she lived doubled up with others, stayed for long stretches of time in motels, and also had periods of relative stability that would eventually be disrupted. In Nancy's case, a divorce led her to lose housing midway through the study. At other times, the inability to afford market rate rent would eventually catch up to her. At one point, she was living in a more remote town to access cheaper housing. She didn't have a car at this time. She didn't have her license. Transportation was a huge challenge for her and led to growing isolation. Um, and despite being in quite a rural area, the, the apartment um, was, was still unaffordable for her. And I remember on the way home from running errands uh, one afternoon, I asked her how much money she had left after paying her rent. She said, I have $84. So... Unsurprisingly, given that after falling behind on her rent, she faced the prospect of eviction and she didn't know where to turn. Remarkably, after seeing a Facebook post uh, describing her situation, the mother of an old family friend reached out to offer Nancy and the kids a place to stay in Georgia. This woman drove through the night to pick up the family. As we loaded totes and bags of the family's possessions into the woman's truck, she told me she couldn't bear to see the children, quote, on the street. And this situation, like many doubling up situations, initially offered stability for Nancy. Not only a place to stay, but also some help with the kids and relief from isolation. But again, relationships began to fray, and ultimately Nancy and the kids found themselves homeless again. And she, at this point, she made the decision to move back to Vermont. And this marked a point of inflection in her experience. Because after returning to Vermont, she re-engaged with her old case manager at the shelter. And with this person's help, she qualified for a supportive housing voucher through a partnership between the shelter and the state of Vermont. Shortly thereafter, she moved into an apartment that capped her rent at 30% of her income. And this marked the first time in the time that I had known her in five or six years at this point that she wasn't paying market rate rent for housing. Moreover, the apartment was located close to the bus line. And with her kids a bit older now and settling into predictable school schedules, Nancy began to look for a job. It's certainly the case that life isn't easy for the family. And She's experienced setbacks during this time, periods of unemployment, challenges with mental health. Their housing, although stable, is substandard. Um, but 
despite experiencing these threats to their stability that in the past might have precipitated another housing crisis, the family's ongoing access to an affordable place to live and a bevy of supportive services and around them has enabled continued security for this family. The family continues to live in this apartment. Nancy's work during most of this time. Her children are supported by a network of teachers, coaches, advocates. They're engaged in their community, participating in sports and music programs, summer camps. The family's visited regularly by case managers who stop by to drop off food to check in with Nancy. And these service providers seem to recognize strength amid ongoing challenges. And this has been interesting. You know, Nancy was always someone who's very critical of, in particular, mental health services. She'd say, ah, I just hate therapy. But over time, these, these relationships that she's had more recently seem to have opened the door to greater openness in engaging with a range of other healthcare providers and mental health services. Outside of formal professional services, she's supported by and she supports a close neighbor. They cook together several times a week, and her neighbor is available to help with the children. Nancy described their connection in this way. We've been through the same shit. Why was her family able to weather the threats to their security? Her experience highlights for us the confluence of structural supports and also Nancy's own strengths and capacities that created possibilities for greater security over time. I want to be clear, affordable housing was the key structural support that conditioned her family's movement towards security. But beyond, this crucial material resource, she also leveraged her personal and social strengths. She's always maintained a network of friends and associates that enabled just-in-time access to scarce resources, food in a pinch, childcare in a pinch, and she in turn would reciprocate, allowing people to crash for a bit on her couch or if they needed a hand or something. And this social network, I think, protected me from the impress of isolation experienced by others in the study. It was very difficult when she was living so far away from this network. When coupled with subsidized housing, Nancy's social orientation facilitated connections to resources, friendship, and opportunities for the family to be more integrated into their community, consequently augmenting material security with a subjective sense of connection and belonging. So I think Nancy's experience is an invitation to all of us to reimagine what is possible and to disrupt pervasive cynicism and the tacit acceptance of the inevitability of homelessness as a problem too big, too complex, maybe too expensive to solve. I believe the Upper Valley can be a national model for ending homelessness that we can leverage what is special about this place, our resources, our skills, our creativity, our resolve, our commitment to community. I think we can flip the script on homelessness here. What if we expected and supported recovery from homelessness? This is not the failure of, quote, broken people, but a reflection of serious fault lines in our society and the diminishment of opportunity. This is also about more than a mindset or a culture change. Awareness and compassion need to be accompanied by practical action for change. And this can be manifest um, in thinking about and working together toward thoughtful development to meet the need. Again, I quote the Keys to the Valley report, noting the need for an additional 10,000 units of housing in the Upper Valley region by 2030 to meet demand. And so thinking together about how it is that we can preserve what we, what we all love and value about this very special place, while at the same time increasing our capacity, increasing our capacity to serve our communities. Thinking about ways to develop affordable housing that's close to town centers, that might not only could, could protect against loneliness and boredom, could lessen transportation challenges, and promote greater access to health and community resources. 
Massachusetts. I think there's an opportunity to link the progressive political orientation of the Upper Valley to practical actions that can increase housing inventory and options for affordable housing in the region. Investments in infrastructure, changes to zoning policies to enable higher density housing proximate to services and resources will be crucial to increasing opportunities for community members to live and thrive in the Upper Valley. And so in closing, I began this uh, talk tonight in thinking about the work of the anthropologist, the work of the ethnographer. And this is work that allows us the enormous privilege of spending time with people in the settings of their everyday lives. We cross over thresholds into the intimate spaces of family life in this work. It's a form of bearing witness. It's a form of long-term participation with families. And this helps us to illuminate the catalyst of disruption, but also of hope and possibility. Things could have been otherwise. Tragic outcomes demand that we ask, how could this have ended differently for this family? And those who move toward greater security over time compel the question, how can more families have access to the structural resources and supports that can amplify their strengths? And so I end tonight with the question that I end the book with, and it's an invitation for us. What can you do to create interactions and environments that destabilize stigma, promote compassion, and advocate for equity? Thank you so much. Stop share. Are there any questions or things that people would like to discuss? We can open things up a bit. I wonder if you could talk, uh, thank you for the talk, it was fantastic. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that paradox of visibility. Uh, when I think of uh, unhoused populations and homeless crises across the country, like you pointed out, that's usually an urban phenomenon. Right. Um, and it sometimes seems that it takes a certain kind of visibility to get communities, politicians, whatever it is, to take a degree of action. Um, and I was struck by that comment earlier in your presentation, in part because I also read earlier today that the Haven is lighting like 334 mm -hmm. candles yeah. um, in order to kind of bring some sense of visibility to the scale and scope right. of what you're talking about. That's right. um, but at the same time, visibility also brings in all of those feelings about self-reliance and whether people are uh, living up to their own expectations, if not sort of the region's expectations. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role that visibility plays in this particular crisis. Absolutely. So I think for, you know, for, for a long time, um, these were issues that really remained under the radar, except for those who are working in social services, except for those who may be working in the health field um, associated with, uh, with the Haven. And, and so that, I think, you, I think you're absolutely right. You're pointing to the ways in which, um, you know, that I think has kind of put us behind where we maybe needed to be in, in recognizing this as the crisis and the emergency that it is for, for families. And so it's my hope that it's this type of work that can begin to really shine a light on these experiences and to, and to think together about this, this may not be um, this may not be something that people are confronting in their day-to-day -day lives as they're going about their their you know their days in the upper valley. It's certainly not as visible as it is um, in urban settings, and yet the reality of this, you know, this has just been at the surface, it's hidden in plain sight. And so I think efforts like the luminaries to um, to draw people's attention. The scale of the issue. And this is something that with housing and security, we all likely know people who are facing tremendous housing insecurity. Um, and, and certainly many, many people are in the position of being one loss away from financial devastation. And so really having that be an opportunity and an invitation to lead with empathy in these books. Um, and that's a that's a big component of humanizing. Um, the, the, as we think about um, home
homelessness moving away from this as an abstraction. And that's really what I've tried to center in this work is that we're talking about people, that we're talking about our neighbors, community members, and what's our collective responsibility. In your experience, how prevalent are mental health issues in the fundamentally housing insecure population in this area? So there's research to suggest that in rural communities, um, it is uh, mental health related challenges may be uh, less prevalent than in uh, populations in, in urban settings. That works a bit old, um, so those data are a bit old. Um, but it's also the case that we need to be really aware of kind of the, the directionality of, of that. And so oftentimes um, there, there are many myths associated with homelessness that mental illness or substance use are causing homelessness. And I think it's important that we always, again, foreground the fact that homelessness is, is a housing related problem. And to think about the ways in which housing insecurity um, has tremendous mental health implications for people. And so, if, again, enduring chronic stress in that way, um, enduring financial precarity is so detrimental to people's mental health and well being. Can you speak a little bit more to the housing insecurity? It just strikes me when I first um, started learning about unhoused populations, that there was a conversation that, you know, for the majority of people, it's temporary. And for a few people, it lasts for a very long time. And with the current and ongoing housing crisis here and across the nation, there seems to be a shift to what you're, what you're discussing, where, where it's chronic for more people because they are just on the edge. And I'm having a hard time understanding the scale of that um, and what the scale looks like. Like it strikes me that we might be very close to many more people um, living without homes, mm -hmm. but I don't know how close or you know, how many. It's a really key issue. Um, and I think, and I think that's right in terms of more and more people facing financial precarity. And I think it's very under-recognized the degree to which people are, are on the edge in this way. Um, there was um, data several years ago suggesting that a majority of Americans would not have the funds available to cover an emergency um, expense of $400. Right? This is not an uncommon challenge. And so as we see just the, the costs of, of housing here and, and throughout the country rising, skyrocketing astronomically, um, this is uh, this is this is a lot, this is affecting a very large part of, of our community and our, and our population. Um, another part of your talk that I was really struck by was this idea of the importance of connection with community, but particularly with families. Um, I don't know if you can speak more to that and whether, you know, if somebody is able to locate themselves more in a community, what types of benefits does that family see, um, either in terms of child care or child independence? or access to jobs or services. Is, uh, you spoke some about the bus line, um, but I was wondering if you had more specific stories to share around connection and the importance of connection. So, you know, I think a lot of times I would see the inverse of connection, right? A lot of times I was seeing the impact of that kind of extreme isolation and being on one's own. Um, you know, in a, in a very remote town um, and the ways in which you know that uh, that would that would be very detrimental to people over time and so Nancy is a she's a wonderful example I think for us of the ways in which 
she has, she and her family have really been integrated into everyday life in the community, the school community, where her kids go to school. Um, in her work community, she maintains a network of friends. Um, she has a close neighbor. And these are the same way as any of us would want to be relating to others in our lives and the ways in which all of us are supported by and strive to support others within our lives. And so I think that, again, for us to consider the context of, of someone of housing, how can we, how can we help people to, to build and strengthen um, their connections to, to other people. It's, it's also the case, um, certainly, and I've learned from my friends who are in the mental health field, you know, the importance of thinking about this through a trauma-informed lens as well. And so recognizing and realizing that people who have experienced homelessness have undergone tremendous trauma that may make it difficult for them to forge connections. And so they will need additional supports um, that are trauma-informed in order to build those types of healthy relationships. 